have compulsory military service, what uh, a man does in Switzerland when he reaches draft aid. He does a period of active duty in the Swiss Army. I believe it's two years. After that, he goes into the reserves and is called up for a certain period of active duty each year, rather like our National Guard. Every able-bodied man in Switzerland serves in the reserves, and I believe they stay in the reserves to the, at least the minimum age of 50. It might even be as high as 60, okay? Every able-bodied male in Switzerland is in the reserves, and all of the members of the reserves keep their military weapon. Again, a, an assault rifle capable of selective fire, either semi or fully automatic, in their home with a supply of ammunition. If the cry on the uh, behalf of gun control advocates that guns produce crime was a valid one, that would be the most crime-ridden and homicide-ridden nation on earth. It is not. They have a relatively low crime and homicide rate. One of the things we're seeing is a, a lot of crocodile tears being shed about drive-by shootings and uh, gun killings in uh, some of our poor inner-city neighborhoods, South Central L.A., for example. There are many stories in the media about uh, a child or a young person who gets uh, killed in a gang banging, and this in turn is meant to generate sympathy for gun control legislation. I certainly don't hold a brief for gang banging or the murder of young people or children, but the fact of the matter is, it is not the presence of firearms in these neighborhoods that produces the crime. It is poverty and other socioeconomic factors that produce crime. If you took, say, South Central Los Angeles and kept exactly the same type of firearms present there that are present today, and just as many firearms, just as many Uzis, just as many Tech 9s, just as many AKs, just as many shotguns, but if you raise the average income for the head of household to $30,000 a year, the way it is in more affluent white neighborhoods, you would not be seeing the same crime problem and the same problem with regard to shooting deaths. Uh, the equation in our media of murder and crime with guns is a false one. Crime has been going down for years. Homicides have also been going down. But I spoke earlier in the lecture about uh, the most scholarly document that I have seen to date uh, talking about First Amendment rights. If you're or Second Amendment rights, excuse me. If you're interested in the Second Amendment, this is the most scholarly document to date. It is the Tennessee Law Review. Again, the quarterly law journal of the University of Tennessee Law School, Volume 62, Spring of 95, Volume three, or Number Three. Excuse me. There are a lot of excellent discussions of uh, issues surrounding Second Amendment rights in here. I'm going to read you uh, a few statistics. Now, by the way, Israel is also one of the most heavily armed nations per capita with a very low crime and homicide rate, because, again, Israeli males remain in the reserves. Israel has compulsory uh, military service for women as well as men, and they are very heavily armed, yet they have a relatively low crime and homicide rate. Again, it is socioeconomic factors, poverty in particular, that produces crime. If it were guns and the presence of guns, we would not hear the following. Now this is from an essay, and I'm going to find the authors here, in this particular, uh, well, let me find the, I'll, I'll read it from the table of contents. This is from an essay entitled, Guns and Public Health, Epidemic of Violence or Pandemic of Propaganda. It's by Don B. Cates, K-A-T-E-S, Henry E. Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R, Ph.D., John K. Latimer, L-A-T-T-I-M-E-R, M.D., George B. Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, M.D., and Edwin W. Kasem, C-A-S-S-E-M, M.D. And among the things they discuss is the following. Bearing in mind what I said about Switzerland, Denmark, whose strict anti-gun laws Professor Baker, a gun control advocate, praises, has almost four times more homicide than Switzerland and more than four times more homicide than Israel. Switzerland's very gun-restrictive neighbor Germany has about 25% more homicide and 50% more than Israel. Germany's uh, very gun-restrictive neighbor Belgium has over 20% more homicide than Germany, and their mutual very gun-restrictive neighbor Luxembourg has over 100% more homicide. England, with its much ballyhooed anti-gun strictness, has the lowest homicide rate of all, but Scotland with exactly the same laws, has almost three times as much homicide as England and much more than Israel or Switzerland. Again, if guns were the key variable, these statistics could not exist, okay? The point being 
that the argument that guns produce crime and that the need to restrict people's access to firearms will reduce crime is a specious one. It is propaganda. The question is, who is generating it and why? And bear in mind William O. Wells and William Colby, uh, the late William Colby, two of the most active people in the American gun control movement, both of them with CIA backgrounds. Now, another element of hocus-pocus that we're hearing about, and that concerns the danger that firearms, handguns in particular, represent such a danger to our children. And again, bear in mind the Stockton Schoolyard incident, where this lone nut who had contact with Aryan nations, worked for the Moonies, was traveling all around the United States, supposedly ripping off uh, servers' tips off of restaurant tables. Try that sometime. See the United States on stolen tips. I'll give you a tip. It won't work. We're being told, though, however, we're seeing all these edit op-ed columns in our newspapers about the danger that firearms present to our children, and in particular the need to ban handguns because our children are having, uh, they get their hands on some gun and then they kill each other. Well, first of all, uh, the total gun stock in the United States, the total number of firearms, has increased 173% in the 20-year period from 1967 to 1986. Yet firearm a fatal gun accidents declined by two-thirds over that period. Now, again, if it were the presence of firearms that produced fatal gun accidents, that could not happen. Again, between 1967 and 1986, firearms ownership increased 173% in the United States and fatal gun accidents declined by two-thirds. One of the reasons for that is that most of the, per most of the weapons purchased were for defense against crime and they were handguns. Handguns are much less susceptible to fatal accidents than long guns for a couple of reasons. In the first place, they can be more easily locked up away from children. In the second place, handguns do not fire as powerful rounds as long guns, shotguns and rifles. So therefore, when there is an accident, the rounds are not as destructive. Uh, long guns are usually stored either in a rack or leaned up against a wall. A certain percentage of nitwits who own them uh, leave them loaded, they'll fall down or tip over, discharge, and that produces an accident. There are also hunting accidents as well. Uh, the point being that if it were the presence of guns that produces fatal gun accidents, how do you account for the fact that in that 20-year period, uh, the firearms ownership in the United States increased by 73%, and yet gun accidents dropped by two-thirds? Doesn't make sense. And again, the notion that guns represent such a danger to our children, bear in mind Patrick Edward Purdy and the implanting of this thought that guns are killing our precious little children, uh, that dog won't hunt, so to speak, as they say in the Deep South. And uh, some of the statistics with regard to what it really is that represents a threat to our children are delineated as follows in this same essay. We offer, the authors present, we offer the following questions, which of course are never mentioned in the health advocacy literature on children and guns. If so sweeping a measure as confiscating 230 million firearms is justified because some 273 children under age 15 die in firearm accidents annually, is the less intrusive measure of banning child bicycles justified by the death of three times as many children in bicycle accidents annually. Again, we're not seeing some great hue and cry to ban children's access to bicycles, which kill three times as many children annually as, as firearms. Again, the authors go on to say, if confiscating over 80 million handguns is justified because approximately 15 children under age 5 die in handgun accidents annually, is a ban on cigarette lighters justified by the fact that four times as many children in that age group die from playing with them annually? Consider the fact that over 400% more children under age 15 die in drownings than in gun accidents. 20 times as many children under age 5 drown in bathtubs and home swimming pools as are killed in handgun accidents. Few people need a bathtub as opposed to a shower stall or a swimming pool. A swimming pool. If the tragedy of accidental childhood gun fatalities justifies confiscating over 80 million handguns, or all of the more than 230 million firearms, do the much greater numbers of tragic childhood drownings justify a licensing system under which only the disabled and others who show they, quote, truly need, unquote, a bathtub or swimming pool, allow them to have them? Again, I think the facts speak for themselves. It is not guns that are killing our children. Uh, a very, very, very provocative thesis has been presented in a book 
that uh, I read an excerpt of uh, live on Roy's show a number of weeks ago. This is a book, and by the way, this guy was a guest I uh, noted on uh, Jerry Brown's show some weeks ago. Uh, he was a guest on uh, Brown's show, I think, week before last. It's a book called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society. It's by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, who is described on the back flap here as a former Army Ranger and paratrooper. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman taught psychology at West Point and is currently the professor of military science at Arkansas State University. And I'm going to read the jacket flap, which presents the thesis he presents in this book. The 20th century, with its bloody world wars, revolutions, and genocides accounted for hundreds of millions of dead, would seem to prove that human beings are incredibly vicious predators and that killing is as natural as eating. But, but Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, a psychologist and U.S. Army Ranger, demonstrates this is not the case. The good news, according to Grossman, drawing on dozens of interviews, first-person reports, and historic studies of combat ranging from Frederick the Great's battles in the 18th century through Vietnam, is that the vast majority of soldiers are loath to kill. In World War II, for instance, only 15 to 25 percent of combat infantry were willing to fire their rifles. The provocative news is that modern armies using Pavlovian and operative conditioning have learned how to overcome this reluctance. In Korea, about 50% of combat infantry were willing to shoot, and in Vietnam, the figure rose to over 90%. The bad news is that by conditioning soldiers to overcome their instinctive loathing of killing, we have drastically increased post-combat stress, witnessed the devastated psychological state of our Vietnam vets as compared with those from earlier wars. And the truly terrible news is that contemporary civilian society, particularly the media, replicates the Army's conditioning techniques According to Grossman's controversial thesis, it, uh, excuse me, and the truly terrible news is that contemporary civilian society, particularly the media, replicates the Army's conditioning techniques and, according to Grossman's controversial thesis, is responsible for our rising rates of murder and violence, particularly among the young. In the explosive last section of the book, he argues that high body count movies, television violence, both news and entertainment, and interactive point and shoot video games are dangerously similar to the training programs that dehumanize the enemy, desensitize soldiers to the psychological ramifications of killing, and make pulling the trigger an automatic response. And indeed, in this book, he makes a very, very compelling argument for that. One of, I alluded earlier to, to something I touched on in considerable detail in one of my mind, in my mind control lecture, again, available from She Who Remembers. I alluded to the conditioning by elements of naval intelligence of passive-aggressive personalities in order to condition them as mind-controlled assassins. One of the things that they did was to show them increasingly violent films while encouraging them to notice trivial details about this film, conditioning them to accept violent things. For example, one was a horribly bloody film of an African circumcision rite in which uh, a young a uh, male who's about to become a man is circumcised right on camera, and you see this going on. And then they're shown films of, of uh, fresh automobile accidents with the mangled victims dying or dead. And uh, this is all done to desensitize the uh, mind control candidate to the ramifications of violence. Indeed, as someone whose academic background is in the field of psychology, I have noticed the similarity between some of the conditioning procedures described in books like Operation Mind Control and the, uh, to the basic parameters of some of these uh, video games that children are, uh, in, are playing. And I suspect that Dave Grossman, again, a former uh, lieutenant colonel, a former paratrooper and ranger, uh, a person who taught psychology at West Point and is now professor of military science at Arkansas State, I think he is right on the money. And it is these things that are producing an epidemic of violence among the young and not the presence of firearms. And I think we would do well, I mean, it gets into an issue of First Amendment rights, but I think we would do well to limit our children's access to these high body count movies. And I must say, some of the films that are coming out now are absolutely unbelievable. I mean, they're sort of like a three-dimension uh, live action Roadrunner cartoon, you know? And uh, I, I suspect that Dave Grossman is absolutely on the money and that it is conditioning our children to accept violence that is producing violent children and not the presence of firearms. Indeed, if you take a look at American history, this is a violent country. The first two and a half centuries of capital expansion in the United States were accomplished through slave labor and genocide. 
You think this country isn't violent? Ask the Indians. They'll tell you about it. Uh, and so it should not really come as too much of a surprise that we uh, have a lot of violence in this society. I wonder to what extent we are literally being trained as a violent nation by our media. The intelligence community and the military is deeply involved with the media, as are fascist elements. Now again, uh, I think there are a number of conclusions that can be drawn from the information we presented by way of tying up the lecture, and we're obviously going to finish in time to have some questions. First of all, it is not guns that produce crime. It is criminal minds of one sort or another, either people driven to desperation by socioeconomic factors, or perhaps, in these some cases, uh, some of them are nuts, certainly. Perhaps some of them deliberately programmed nuts sent out by our government to justify this. It is rather the, the human beings that produce crime, not the presence of guns. I wonder to what extent uh, the government is deliberately, as I said, promoting some of these low nuts, and certainly fascist elements of our government are behind our political assassinations, which, uh, again, supposedly performed by low nuts, has served as a pretext for the gun control legislation, in particular the Gun Control Act of 1968, crafted by Citizen Dodd. It was, a, was uh, given impetus by our political assassinations, and again patterned directly on the Nazi Weapon Control Act of 1938, which passed two days after, which was instituted two days after the Crystal Mark. Uh, when and if this country uh, goes totally fascist, and I believe it will, I believe the coup de grace will come after an economic collapse, perhaps gradual, perhaps precipitous, I can't say which, and that the resulting political crisis will, will plunge this country into fascism. Uh, I think to those people who are beating the drum now to deny themselves, deny public access to firearms, may very well want access to a gun. For example, if the Rex 84 martial law uh, contingency plans are put into effect, and paramilitary right-wingers, such as the, some of the fascist elements within the militias, are deputized as plans call for them to be. And when they show up at your door at 4 o'clock in the morning, you may want to have access to a gun to fight back. Or, uh, say, if a, a group of Nazi pogromists shows up at your door, say you're black, say you're Jewish, say you're gay, say you're a liberal. And by the way, fascist elements in the United States are right now compiling lists of people to be done in. Say a bunch of eight or nine skinheads shows up at your front door with a bunch of guns, you may damn well wish you had a gun to fight back. I don't think that uh, firearms are likely to be of a lot of use in uh, fighting against the military. Uh, however, it remains to be seen whether the military would fire on American citizens uh, if those citizens were armed and willing to fight back. I also want to note that uh, firearms... Uh, and the move to limit firearms is working to the benefit of the forces of a political reaction. Just look at the hay, the political hay, the people like Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole are making from opposing the assault weapons ban. And again, in uh, many parts of our country, uh, the South and the West in particular, firearms are so much an intrinsic part of our culture that banning access to them is simply going to produce a blind political reaction. People who would not otherwise be driven into the ranks of fascism will do that, and people whose uh, economic interests would not uh, mandate that they vote for Newt Gingrich or Bob Dole or some other Republican, and the Republicans are the party of the wealthy and the privileged. Uh, I say you have some farmer or hunter or hardware store operator or uh, factory worker. Uh, he might, would not ordinarily vote for a Gingrich or Dole or a Republican congressperson because that it is not in their best economic interest to do that. But the Republicans, and Newt Gingrich has even stated this at times, they like to use social issues to polarize people and inflame them so that they will then vote Republican and adopt their economic agenda. And just as I posed the question at the beginning of the lecture, uh, I, I hope I have illustrated the dichotomy that exists within the gun control movement, although, again, a liberal political godchild by reputation, as we, I, I hope, have seen, there is a very strong fascist and apparent national security connection to the gun control movement. And just as I asked the question concerning the militias, are they really an enemy or a pawn of the state, I wonder to what extent perhaps fascist elements inside and or outside of government might be deliberately triggering some of these incidents in order to produce a sentiment for gun control so that they can use the reaction against that to recruit 
for uh, recruit people into the fascist ranks and or to get them to uh, vote for Newt Gingrich or Bob Dole or whatever other form of uh, Cretaceous dinosaur uh, the Republicans are offering up for electoral consumption. So again, I think that it is apparent that there is a very strong connection, albeit one that I think needs to be much more fully explored. And I want to stress yet again that many of the things that I have spoken about this evening are conjectural, but I think there is a very strong and, to the willing observer, obvious connection between fascism, gun control, and the intelligence community, and that is exactly why that was the, sub the title of this particular lecture. And again, I wonder to what extent the push for gun control may actually be a push for fascism. Uh, my first, the first of my first, uh, my two former co-hosts, uh, Mark Ortiz, uh, had a bumper sticker made up, which I think uh, I not only agree with, but which uh, I think will serve as a marvelous closing point for the formal part of the lecture this evening. He had a, you know there's that bumper sticker that says, when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. Well, he had a bumper sticker uh, made up for his car that said, when guns are outlawed, only fascists will have guns. And indeed, I think that is the case. And that concludes the formal part of the lecture this evening. I want to thank uh, people for showing up this evening. I very much appreciate not only your attention, but your generosity and your patience under the circumstances. Thank you. Uh, he may not have had a choice. Also, some of these families, it might take on a lot of these fascist families, is they would probably be proud of something like that. See, who knows how much he's really been sacrificed. He's in uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where he also is very closely connected to the intelligence community and mind control programs. How sacrificed is he, really? He's sitting there getting his three squares a day, and uh, he's a hero, man. He put a bullet in red, and he worked for the Nazi cause. And as far as Hinckley being close to Bush, uh, when you control the media and you can put thoughts into people's brains, you can be obvious. I mean, when you study this country's political assassinations, as soon as you move the camera to the man behind the curtain, as soon as you get away from the lone nut, you know, uh, Hinckley wants to make it with Jody Foster and he read The Catcher in the Rye, so he shoots the president. Or Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, the communist traitor who hangs out with anti-Castro Cubans and uh, the defense industry uh, high rollers and uh, petroleum industry magnets. You know, he, he's, he uh, couldn't get enough sex, so he shot President Kennedy, to be not you know, notable. Uh, every president we've had since Kennedy, with the exception of Carter and Clinton, were involved either in Kennedy's assassination or one of the subsequent cover-ups, including the House Select Committee. But when you control the media, including the so-called progressive sector, and please note the use of the term so-called, um, you don't need to be all that careful. I mean, it, it's... Uh, if I were to try to get on KPFK daytime programming and talk about these things, forget about it, man. They put me on a rail and tar and feather me and ride me yeah, all the way to San Luis Obispo. There's no way. They don't want to hear about this. They want, and like I say, I was talking with some people outside. They want to talk about, you know, the West Los Angeles uh, left-handed lesbian film collective. You know, they don't want to talk about fascism. They don't want to talk about gun control, you know. Or uh, they want to talk about, you know, the Orange County Mexican, uh, albino Mexican-American Civic League or something, you know, just that does, isn't relevant, you know. And this is, it should no way be interpreted as a slam on, on, on either Mexican-Americans or lesbians. But again, like I said, the, uh, if, they, if they were in a civic association for albino Mexican-Americans, you'd have two-hour specials on it on KPFK, and everybody would sit around uh, telling themselves how marvelous they are and how clever they are, and you can't fool them because they're just so clever. And they're clever because, well, they're them, and they're clever because they're them. So... Uh, <laughs> When you're dealing with fools, you don't need to be all that subtle. And when you control the media, because there are a lot of people in this country who aren't fools, then uh, that would do it. But as far as uh, Hinckley Jr., he might very well be to the Nazi faithful, because I think Bush is a Nazi with a capital N, and certainly his family has a long history of involvement with the industrial uh, and financial axis that supported Hitler. Uh, and uh, they might, he might very well be a hero to them, you know? That's... That's conjecture. I mean, I, I don't socialize with the Hinckleys. They're, I'm not on the social register, so I, I'm necessarily uh, guessing at that. But uh, and how, why was he necessarily sacrificed? He could be living the life of Riley in St. Elizabeth. That's where they interned Ezra Pound, who broadcast fascist propaganda for uh, Mussolini during World War II. He then uh, was deemed to be mentally ill. It wasn't that he was a traitor. He was an enthusiastic fascist, but because he was one of America's greatest uh, contemporary poets, 
rather than say this guy's a raving fascist, all the good uh, literati in our universities, impeccably liberal, they just they didn't want to, uh, to convict the guy and sentence him. So they stuck him in St. Elizabeth's because he was supposed to be mentally ill, and upon release from St. Elizabeth's, he walked out with this big smirk on his face, gave the fascist salute. You know, he was a fascist. You know, he wasn't uh, nuts. So uh, the same thing with Hinckley. Who knows uh, what kind of life he might be living in there. Yes, sir. I don't think they're actually anti-gun. My, my own take, I hope I would have explained during the lecture, is that they're doing this to provoke, and again, the key words, polarization and stratification. Impose gun control, use it to polarize the crap out of parts of the country. Whoa, I shouldn't use that word. There's that naughty word. I'm not on the air, you know? Give me a break. This is a lecture, you know? I'm, I'm very observant of FCC regs. You don't need to zap me when I use a four-letter word. My goodness. See? Fascism, folks. It's everywhere. Big Brother is always watching or listening. Can't even use bathroom words at a lecture among uh, consenting adults, so to speak. So, uh, but again, I think that they're doing that quite deliberately. You know, uh, Joe and Jane six-pack down in Tent Flap, Louisiana, or Frozen Monkey, Idaho. You know, by God, we're not going to give up our guns. And so you pass it, and you freak them out and say, oh, you know, I read about this in the Turner Diaries. If they're getting ready to do it, we better go out and join the National Alliance and get ready for the day of the rope. You know, and, uh, and they do it. And then, you know, oh, nudie, nudie, he gets up there, you know, he's a real American. You know, he's, supp he's opposed to the, the gun control ban. He's opposed to the assault weapon ban. And Bob Dole, well, he's a real good American. You know, and I can't make my payments on my farm, so I'm going to vote Republican, and then I'll be able to make my payments on my farm. <laughs> uh, one born every day, as P.T. Barnum said. But I think it's being done quite deliberately. And they go out and say, I'm going to join my militia because I want to hang on to my assault rifle, you know. Uh, that's why I think they're doing it. I think it's altogether deliberate and as cynical as everything else they do. So, you know, David, you want to think how cynical he is. Uh, talk, we're talking about uh, bathroom words. He, uh, one of his former campaign aides, uh, broke the story that uh, she used to perform oral sex on him on a regular basis, but that he would only consent to oral sex because that way he could say honestly that he'd never slept with anyone outside of his marriage. No, he didn't sleep with him. He just, you know, dropped his trousers and, uh, and, and she did it to it, you know. And uh, so that's what kind of cynics you're dealing with, you know. That's what kind of cynics you're dealing with, you know. Yep. Yes, sir. Not offhand. It should be easy enough to find. Not offhand. Yes, ma'am. The more there's more resistance to organized fascism in other countries, although probably not enough. In this country, people don't even know what fascism is, including the so-called progressive sector. In fact, I was chatting with some people outside about that. People don't know what fascism is. Uh, when I was driving down for my last lecture, there was some complete linthead on, uh, I don't know what program they did, what the name of the program is. It was their pre-news program between five and six, and they had, uh, they had Ingo beneath the surface, barely beneath the surface, you know, uh, about one micron beneath the surface. Um, they had Ingo Hasselbach, a former German so-called neo-Nazi, who's now reformed and, and uh, has turned against his former compatriots, and his, uh, he wrote a book and, his, and was doing a lecture tour with his co-author promoting the book. And they had some woman whose name I forget mercifully, uh, who was supposedly an expert on fascism. Well, I don't know if it's Susie Wiseman or whatever, but whoever it was wasn't as wise as she seemed to think she was. And, and this, this person flat out didn't know anything. And one of my listeners called up and was talking about the corporate connection to fascism, you know, and then talking about Mussolini's corporate state. She said, that conspiracy theory, I think that's fascist itself. You know, it's, Later, you know, it, well, I don't know who it was, but whoever it was, uh, basically, as far as fascism goes, this this gal couldn't tell a dirt road from a chicken with lips, and she was dumb, you know. But you know, they don't know what fascism is. 
you know, there's, uh, if you ever want to see the, the so-called progressive forces at their ig willfully ignorant worst, read it, pick up, don't, don't buy it, don't waste your money, but pick up a copy of Z Magazine and thumb through it sometime. If that publication were put it on softer paper, it would be useful. There was the most incredible, there was the most incredible hocus pocus in there. And I remember a column by Sarah Diamond, right? And she's the, uh, Sarah Diamond is one of the designated experts for the so-called progressive forces about fascism. She wrote a book, and she had a good book called The Spiritual Warfare about the Christian Right. And she wrote in her new book, which is her doctoral thesis called Roads to Dominion, about the growth of the right. And she asked us a question, how did the far right grow from just a few small groups at the end of World War II to being so powerful today? A few small groups? Sweet, creeping Jesus. You're talking about the MacArthur Group and much of the rest of the uh, uh, general staff. Uh, many of the most powerful corporations and their heads and uh, the chief executive officers. We incorporated the cream of the Third Reich's national security establishment. Uh, and some of our domestic fascist groups are huge. A group nobody's ever heard of. Clark's Crusaders uh, with 135,000 strong. That's the equivalent of nine combat divisions. That's not a small group. Fascism, and then you, when you take a look at the fact that our, our uh, industrialists and financiers, many of them, and our corporations, many of them, backed Hitler and Mussolini because of their doctrinaire anti-communist and anti-labor stance. When you note that the Third Reich's racial legislation was in many ways based on our own eugenics legislation and wholeheartedly endorsed by American eugenicists, such as the people in the Pioneer Fund, which is currently very much on the scene and looms large in the background of Proposition 187, and uh, the bell curve, that heinously racist uh, bestseller of a couple of years ago. And here's, here's this expert saying, you know, how, you know, how did it grow from a few small groups? Jesus, that's a few small groups. I'd hate to see some big ones. But she's an expert, and uh, I remember a column she had in Z Magazine. You know, this is not to say that Sarah hasn't done some good work. I know her, but uh, she, uh, you know, she says, is it fascism yet? In other words, the idea is that there's fascism or it's not fascism, like a switch you throw, and it doesn't work that way. If the fascism is, uh, when a country that descends into fascism descends gradually, that's one of the things that makes it so insidious, because we still have, you know, all of the entertainment, the baseball games, and the hoo-ha, and the rock concerts, and the cultural events, and people can uh, sit around in uh, West L.A. or Santa Monica drinking their white wine and eating their brie and have a nice little yuppie night on the town. And yet all around them, things are changing. It's a gradual process. So uh, it's not a question of fascism or not fascism. It's something that uh, uh, comes on the scene gradually. That's one of the reasons why people sit still for it. Yes, Ruthie. Well, it was a domestic fascist group. I don't know a great deal about them. There's not a lot in uh, the literature, but it was one of many American fascist groups, like the Silver Shirts, uh, the Christian Mobilizers of Gerald L. K. Smith, uh, the Black Legion in Detroit, the Ku Klux Klan, the German American Bund. It was a it was a fascist group in the United States. You betcha, with 130, 135,000 of them. And they, there was no Nuremberg trial for them at the end of the world. What do you think they did? They joined the Red Cross? <laughs> no, they stayed in the intact, and they... This was uh, in the 1930s. Uh, I would assume, you know, I, I, as far as I know, there was no action taken against them. Indeed, 135,000 uh, armed fascists, it's kind of tough to take action. Who the hell can take action against them except for the Army? And certainly Douglas MacArthur and General Willoughby weren't going to take action against them. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Good. I think it's really interesting to look at this free men stand up. By the way, there was an article in the New York Times, the seed capital to support this group, the free men. Uh, there was a great cartoon, by the way. I don't know if you get it down here. It's a cartoonist, political cartoonist named Tim Egan, who does a thing called Deep Cover. I don't know if you ever seen really clever, really clever stuff. And he did one about the Montana standoff. He called them the free lunch men. And he just said, you know, all we want to do is have these guys, these venal characters. We want to be able to print our own money, make our own laws, have our own courts, and kill anybody we want to. You know, and then they were saying the other demands. You know, we want the, the first cup of coffee, the last piece of pizza, you know. And, and, it, and, the, last, and the last panel, it shows the FBI agents who are holding them seeds. He turned to one another and says, I wonder if they're taking applications, you know. So, again, the free lunch men. The seed capital for these so-called freemen, or a bunch of fascists, you know, raving anti-Semites, I'm very sympathetic to the plight of the farmers who are getting squeezed dry by agribusiness, but it ain't, you know, Zionist occupation government or Jewish financiers who's doing it, or the United Nations, or the freaking Illuminati. It's, it's the, the, the multinationals uh, who are moving into agribusiness big time. But uh, they, the, the capital with which they used to build their little uh, heaven on earth up there, 
with $676,000 in federal agricultural subsidies. Huh? And they don't they, they want to print their own money. I think that's good. I think they ought to return that $676,000 in U.S. tax dollars and then print their own fucking money, you know? I, I like that one as a uh, starter for the so-called free men. Uh, I think this is basically something that is used, once again, to inflame the militias. There was a militia declaration of war. They call it Operation Your Worst Nightmare, if there's a violent standoff to this. We see city, you know, heroes like Bo Greitz and Randy Weaver uh, now being projected into the national limelight as moderates and uh, national good guys. Uh, you know, Bo Greitz, I got a lot of doubts about. Randy Weaver was a white supremacist. You know, I mean, I don't advocate what was done to him. I think that was wrong. But this guy ain't no hero, but he's, he's a hero there. Just imagine if a group of black people in South Central L.A. were doing the same things that these hockey pucks were doing. They're printing their own money, passing bad checks, uh, threatening to kill the local sheriff and the local judge, uh, driving off neighbors. One of the things that these heroes did was they, a guy who leased like 9,000 acres of land from them to harvest crops, to grow crops. He went to harvest the crops from this land. They drove them off at gunpoint. One of the areas where I think access to firearms is important is because when uh, people have to deal with a bunch of people like these, but like the locals were getting ready to blow these guys away. They'd had enough. They didn't want these people around. They were getting ready to get their guns and go take care of them. But uh, it, it's making these people out in the national limelight. If a bunch of blacks in South Central L.A. were doing this stuff, I'll guarantee you the FBI wouldn't be, uh, and law enforcement wouldn't be taking these hand, this hands off, you know, let's, let's not do anything untoward. Also, there's counter-terrorist technology that could handle these people without violence. They could use uh, a number of devices to knock them out using electromagnetic radiation and go in and just stack them like cordwood and carry them out, you know. I think this is something to elevate these people into the national limelight, make heroes out of them, and recruit more. I think this, this represents the overlap between the government, fascist elements in the government, and fascist elements uh, in or allied with the militias that I spoke about in my last lecture. But they're still up there being free. And that, you know, oh, by the way, huh, let's not lose sight of the fact, in addition to the $676,000 in U.S. tax money that went to finance these hockey pucks in the first place, uh, let's not forget who's paying the salaries of the uh, federal agents who are uh, being so gentle with these characters up there. That's your tax dollars at work, folks. So that's what I think is going on. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's a frightening project which is currently being tested in Alaska, which is going to use a battery of radio transmitters to project unprecedented amounts of radio energy into the ionosphere and uh, magnetosphere to produce a number of effects uh, including uh, the weather control, which has been explicitly stated, the possibility of creating seismic weaponry to create uh, a missile defense in case they ever decide to provoke somebody that has missiles, and a number of other things, including mind control. And I'm terrified by Project Harp. I think it is the ultimate weapon system. And it may, even if it's never used uh, as a weapon, and again, weather control is one of the things they've explicitly stated it will do, uh, this is something which, if they continue to experiment with or use, it could produce an unforeseen disaster which could wipe out Earth. It's, I, I, at some point, am going to be interviewing Nick Begich on my show, and hopefully those tapes will get aired down here. So, I know, In fact, there was a lecture available, also from She Who Remembers, called uh, More Fun with Science, from Port Chicago to Project Pup, in which I, I lectured about that, uh, in, I guess it was this past uh, fall. Or maybe it was last spring. Anyway, I lectured about Project Harp, uh, in part at least, uh, not too many months ago. And Jeannie, you've got the project in More Fun with Science Part 2 from Port Chicago to Project Harp, have you not? Well, you can order it from uh, She Who Remembers. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that these uh, Yep. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think the chances are real good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question. Talk about the assassination political assassination in the past. And the term of the assassination changed, and now we're calling it suicide. Colby, the top Navy man. Uh, Colby supposedly died of natural causes. I can't say that he didn't. I do wonder. Uh, they say, well, he suddenly paddled out in this. Uh, very, very uh, hostile weather conditions. I wonder if he's being chased. I said, hell, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of Dodge. I, I don't know. I don't know what would be hot now that Colby could have run afoul of somebody in relation to I do know that the Nixon tapes were finally released, and Colby was appointed CIA director by Nixon to replace uh, uh, Richard Helms. 
who was about to say Jesse Helms. Unfortunately, he has yet to be replaced. But uh, Richard Helms, who, uh, was, whose resignation was inextricably linked with the machinations surrounding Watergate, perhaps even though those tapes have certainly been sanitized, there may still be some uh, ha, smoking guns in those tapes. Um, so who knows? I wonder. Uh, Colby also, uh, to give you an idea how sick things are, was regarded as one of the more moderate members of the intelligence community. Maybe some of the old guard who got burned by him finally settled the account. Or maybe he did not. As far as James Borda, I don't know. The uh, Navy chief of operations who just shot himself. It is kind of unusual to shoot yourself in the chest if you're going to do that. But I don't know what the, why he might have been killed if, in fact, he was killed. Maybe, and this is pure conjecture, if, if he was killed, perhaps he was a genuine Democrat with a small d and did not believe in fascism. Maybe there's something in the wings that he was opposed to. Maybe they're getting rid of those military officers who might actually stand up to fascism. I don't know. It's pure conjecture. And of course, Vince Foster, I do not think Vince Foster committed suicide. I think he was killed. I don't think Clinton had anything to do with it. Clinton's a yuppie. You know, he's not, he's not a murderer. I mean, he, he inhaled, that's for sure, but he, uh, he's, he's, he's a yuppie. He's the ultimate yuppie, in fact, in my opinion. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, one of the things the underground right does is they blackmail airlines. They knock down planes, and then they, they, just like the mafia, the underground right, and I mean that quite literally, blackmails airlines uh, to get capital. They also uh, are taking over airlines. So it may be that, that these were airlines that did not uh, pay protection money to the underground right. There's uh, an uneven book called Secret and Suppressed, edited by Jim Keith, which has some excellent articles and also has like, a bunch of complete bullshit. But one of the good articles is about, it's called the, 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 the Nazi International, the Fascist International, I've forgotten the title, which talks about the underground right and their blackmailing of airlines. If, in fact, uh, there's anything conspiratorial about it, that might have something to do with it. I'm very suspicious of Ron Brown's plane. I think that might have been not only another message to Clinton, but it will certainly weaken Clinton's campaign uh, that's coming up. might also have been a message from Germany to American corporations. Hey, stay out of our little fiefdom, uh, Yugoslavia. That's our turf. Keep your corporations out. That's our area. They were in Croatia, all right. And the maintenance supervisor for that airport shot himself in the chest shortly after that. You know, we're talking about suicides. Yes, the gentleman with the beard and the long hair. Can you speak more loudly? You've got some competition. Yeah, I've heard about that. I don't know uh, if there's anything to it or not. Uh, the only article I've seen is from Media Bypass, which is sort of a militia-oriented publication. Well, I would take that with a grain of salt. Let's say if there's a, a fifth column within the CIA, I doubt that it uh, has a, a, a positive political orientation from the standpoint of democracy. But I can't say for sure. Uh, I saw that article. I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, I think that it may be that a lot of Congress people that have... Uh, Skeletons in the closet are being forced to resign, but not by some bunch of do-gooders within the CIA. I doubt that. I can't say for sure, but I'm skeptical. Yeah. If, in fact, there is a fifth column, and it wouldn't surprise me that there was, I think it's probably of the exact opposite orientation to being a bunch of uh, upholders of democracy. If democracy is going to be preserved in this country, I would not look to anyone within the CIA to do it. This is not to say that there aren't plenty... There's not there are plenty of very fine men and women in the CIA, the FBI, the armed forces. If there weren't a lot of fine men and women, things would be a hell of a lot worse than they are now. I mean, we'd, we'd be finished now. But at the same time, they have to, these organizations are hierarchical and they have to follow orders. You don't get in the military and disobey an order of a superior officer. I don't care what your instincts are. You damn well do it or you go into the brig, you know, or, or Fort Leavenworth to break rocks. So uh, I've seen that. I can't give you a definitive answer. Uh, I'm skeptical, is all I can say. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yep. The who? The who? Spelled how? 
doesn't ring any bells for me. I mean, there were most of the families, I remember the, the, the broadcast, I remember the book and Army Fact Sheet 64, most of the families were well known in American finance and industry, the DuPonts, the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Mellons. That family does not ring any bells. Doug, I can't, I, I can't, uh, can't help you out there. I, I, it's, it's not familiar to me. Anybody else? If not, we can adjourn. All righty, and uh, we're just. We have compulsory military service. What uh, a man does in Switzerland when he reaches draft aid, he does a period of active duty in the Swiss Army. I believe it's two years. After that, he goes into the reserves and is called up for a certain period of active duty each year, rather like our National Guard. Every able-bodied man in Switzerland serves in the reserves, and I believe they stay in the reserves to the, at least the minimum age of 50. It might even be as high as 60, okay? Every able-bodied male in Switzerland is in the reserves, and all of the members of the reserves keep their military weapon. Again, a, an assault rifle capable of selective fire, either semi or fully automatic, in their home with a supply of ammunition. If the cry on the uh, behalf of gun control advocates that guns produce crime was a valid one, that would be the most crime-ridden of the contents. This is from an essay entitled, Guns and Public Health, Epidemic of Violence or Pandemic of Propaganda. It's by Don B. Cates, K-A-T-E-S. Henry E. Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R, Ph.D., John K. Latimer, L-A-T-T-I-M-E-R, M.D., George B. Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, M.D., and Edwin W. Kaysen, C-A-S-S-E-M, M.D. And among the things they discuss is the following. Bearing in mind what I said about Switzerland, Denmark, whose strict anti-gun laws Professor Baker, a gun control advocate, praises, has almost four times more homicide than Switzerland, and more than four times more homicide than Israel. Switzerland's very gun-restrictive neighbor Germany has about 25% more homicide and 50% more than Israel. Germany's uh, very gun-restrictive neighbor Belgium has over 20 homicide-ridden nation on earth. It is not. They have a relatively low crime and homicide rate. One of the things we're seeing is a, a lot of crocodile tears being shed about drive-by shootings and uh, gun killings in uh, some of our poor inner-city neighborhoods, south-central L.A., for example. There are many stories in the media about uh, a child or a young person who gets uh, killed in a gang banging, and this, in turn, is meant to generate sympathy for gun control legislation. I certainly don't hold a brief for gang banging or the murder of young people or children, but the fact of the matter is, it is not the presence of firearms in these neighborhoods that produces the crime. It is poverty and other socioeconomic factors that produce crime. If you took, say, South Central Los Angeles and kept exactly the same type of firearms present there that are present today, and just as many firearms just as see law school, volume 62, spring of 95, volume three, or number three, excuse me. There are a lot of excellent discussions of uh, issues surrounding Second Amendment rights in here. I'm going to read you uh, a few statistics. Now, by the way, Israel is also one of the most heavily armed nations per capita with a very low crime and homicide rate, because, again, Israeli males remain in the reserves. Israel has compulsory uh, military service for women as well as men, and they are very heavily armed, yet they have a relatively low crime and homicide rate. Again, it is socioeconomic factors, poverty in particular, that produces crime. If it were guns and the presence of guns, we would not hear the following. Now, this is from an essay, and I'm going to find the authors here, in this particular, uh, well, let me find the, I'll read it from the text, as many Uzis, just as many Tech 9s, just as many AKs, just as many shotguns, but if you raise the average income for the head of household to $30,000 a year, the way it is in more affluent white neighborhoods, you would not be seeing the same crime problem and the same problem with regard to shooting deaths. Uh, the equation in our media of murder and crime with guns is a false one. Crime has been going down for years. Homicides have also been going down. But I spoke earlier in the lecture about uh, the most scholarly document that I have seen to date uh, talking about 
First Amendment rights. If you read our Second Amendment rights, excuse me, if you're interested in the Second Amendment, this is the most scholarly document to date. It is the Tennessee Law Review, again, the quarterly law journal of the University of Tennessee.